Marguerite de Navarre, Marguerite of Angoulême, the learned queen. Can we say that Marguerite was Anne Boleyn's mentor? Can we argue that Anne Boleyn wouldn't be the woman and the queen she became without the influence, the example of Marguerite of Angoulême? Who was Marguerite of Angoulême? In this video, this is where I want to discuss with you who she was, what she did in her lifetime, and obviously, I want to discuss her reformed ideas, but also her intelligence, her writings, her true support for the arts. And I'm going to also discuss her relationship with Anne Boleyn, what we know. Why do we think that Marguerite was such a mentor for Anne Boleyn? The only daughter of Charles de Valois, Comte d'Angoulême, and this is why she's known as Marguerite of Angoulême and Louise of Savoy, Marguerite is a sister of the future King Francis I of France. She was born on the 11th of April 1492 in Angoulême, in the Nouvelle Aquitaine region of southwestern France. But she was raised and spent her childhood in Cognac, a town in the same region that is today known for its ominous drink. There, her brother Francis was born two years later, and they born really quickly. They were not the branch that was supposed to rule. Yet, her mother, Louise of Savoy, was going to do everything she could to put her son on the throne. And because of Francis' childhood and his closeness to Marguerite, Marguerite is going to rise at her brother's court like no one before. During their youth, it is true that Angoulême was a place full of artists, of scholars, of singers. It offered a unique learning experience for Francis and Marguerite. Louise of Savoy knew how important it was for women in the 16th century to be well learned, well educated. And she ensured that her daughter was going to be exactly that. And that type of education was going to give a lot of strength to Marguerite. When Charles de Valois, Marguerite's father, died unexpectedly in 1496, the 19-year-old Louise of Savoy continued to raise her children and she continued to make all the decisions when it came to their education. Two years later, upon the sudden death of King Charles VIII, four-year-old Francis was declared heir presumptive in the distant case that the next king, with the twelve, died without a male heir. At that time then, the family decided to move to the royal residence in Blois and then to court in Amboise and finally to Paris. In 1509, Margaret married her first husband, Charles, the Duke of Valençon. This was not her choice, it was a match. She had to do it. She moved to the castle of Valençon, but there it was a luxurious place with no books. And she decided to change this and to incorporate libraries in the castle. We already had Margaret Amagoulum's love for books, education and learning. Very early on, Margaret became involved in charitable programs, visiting the poor and organizing a program to eliminate the need for begging by building hospitals, hospices. And she really funded with her own wealth this type of charitable work. She really believed in the people's well-being. And here again, we have a very clear parallel with Anne Boleyn, who would do the same type of things when she became queen. So we can imagine that there were some types of conversations between Margaret of Angoulême and Anne Boleyn about what it meant to be the elite. Do you have a duty towards the people who are less fortunate than you are? So you know when we talk about Margaret of Angoulême as a mentor, we only talk about the religious beliefs and we're going to discuss this, but I think we have to open our minds that it was more than that. Margaret was a true example to follow in the way she was, in the way she was exerting influence and political power, but also in the way she behaved herself, really. After her brother became king in 1515, Marguerite started to develop lots of interest in reformed ideas. She read and exchanged letters with Erasmus, 
She was particularly influenced by Jacques Lefebvre d'Etape, one of the most respected professors of philosophy in Paris who promoted, among other things, the printing and circulation of the Bible in French. He really believed that if the Bible was in French, more people would have access to it to understand um, what it meant to be a good Christian, a good Catholic. And so here we see that the protest against the Catholic Church started with that, started with a desire to have a more open kind of society, a more inclusive society in many ways. She was introduced later on to Guillaume Brissonnet, Bishop of Meaux, who also had a lot of interest in the reformed ideas. During that time, her brother, who was a very strong Catholic king, kind of looked the other way and let Margaret follow her interest. But then it became more and more difficult to do that because obviously Protestant ideas were really spreading in France and became kind of a danger, a threat to the crown and to the Catholic Church. There is no crown, French crown, without the backing of the Catholic Church. The French king is called the most Christian king and the link between France and the Vatican is so strong that it would mean the end of the monarchy if a reformation, a Protestant reformation, had come from the top of the country. What is remarkable with, with Margaret is her life. In 1525, her husband Charles returned mortally wounded from the disastrous Battle of Pavia, where Francis I himself is going to be taken as a prisoner and sent to Spain. His arch enemy Charles V had a major victory over him. She is sent as an ambassador to Emperor Charles V to negotiate the release of her brother. And it's where it's so interesting that here we have another, you know, the first, what I love with, about Margaret of Angoulême, bear with me, is, is her link with so many of Henry VIII's six wives. Catherine of Aragon was the first female ambassador in Europe, but Margaret of Angoulême was also sent as an ambassador uh, to s help the release of her brother. It, it's going to fail, but it's the attempt and the way she's going to conduct herself that is so powerful and interesting. She has also obviously so many other links with other wives, obviously Anne Boleyn, but also Catherine Parr. Marguerite of Angoulême is the first French woman, noble woman, to write in her own name and to publish under her own name verse and poetry and you know and, and so again we have the same thing that happens in England with Catherine Parr. We have a woman that is so intelligent, politically active, well educated, uh, who really believed in changing the world she was living in, making an impact even if she was only a woman. It's no wonder why she influenced so much the young Anne Boleyn, when Anne Boleyn was at the French court, we saw in the last video on Anne Boleyn's youth, the impact of it, how they met, then probably met, you know, at the court, but also they met during that voyage in Provence in 1515, when Francis I was the winner and not the loser. And we can imagine how many times they met and encountered each other and how the young Anne Boleyn learned from the more experienced, the more sophisticated, the more well-educated Marguerite of Angoulême. Marguerite of Angoulême was a writer, obviously, as I said, she learned much from Clément Marot, a French poet who spent much time at her court and became particularly famous for his metrical version of the Psalms in French. There's obviously a very strong interest in reformed ideas that only grows with Marguerite the more she grows old. Some of her first works were Horizon de l'âme fidèle à son Seigneur Dieu, Prayer of the Faithful Soul to Our Lord, where faith is clearly defined as an unmerited gift of God. She wrote, obviously, Miroir de l'âme pécheresse, The Mirror of the Sinful Soul. It's first published anonymously in 1531. The mirror of the sinful soul is going to be translated by Elizabeth, who is going to gift that translation to her stepmother, Catherine Parr, in 1544-45 as a New Year's gift. Margaret is very close to her brother. However, there are some distance that is going to grow between them. 
As much as Francis loved Marguerite, he distanced himself from her after the infamous affair of the placard, a group who on the night of the 17th October 1534 nailed all over Paris pamphlets denouncing the abuses of the papal mess. The retaliation of Francis I is going to be incredible, he is going to really lash out and prosecute, burn heretics. They would obviously, Marguerite and Francis, reconcile over the years and remain very close. But it is true that he's more and more worried about Marguerite's interest in reformed ideas and in the Protestant Reformation as it's taking more and more place all over Europe. In 1526, she eventually marries Henry II of Navarre and became Queen of Navarre. That is a very important turning point here because Navarre is such an important little territory between Spain and France. It is where Marguerite is also going to show how politically astute she was. She is basically also a French agent at the Navarre court. So it's very interesting to see how the dynamic between her and her new husband is going to take place and how Navarre is going to become a more Protestant country, a more Protestant territory. There is no doubt that Marguerite of Angoulême, Marguerite of Navarre, had a lot of influence on the young Anne Boleyn when Anne Boleyn was in France. But how do we know that she had any influence after that when Anne Boleyn came back to England? Well, we can't know for sure, but I'm going to tell you one thing that is very fascinating. Marguerite of Angoulême was the patron and very close to the Dubélé brothers, especially Jean Dubélé, who was a fervent supporter of Anne Boleyn and the Boleyn faction. It is not too hard to imagine it meant that Margaret might have also, you know, in a more discreet way, in a more reserved way, in an indirect way, supported Anne Boleyn, even if she refused to see her in 1532 in Boulogne. I think she also had to protect her reputation. She knew that Anne Boleyn was really flirting now with a record Rome, something that her brother Francis I would never kind of forgive. Um, you know, it's not because Francis was probably fond of Anne Boleyn in many ways. It's again, it's all in my forthcoming book on Anne Boleyn. But also, it, it was too dangerous for him. There was just too much to lose. I think Marguerite of Angoulême knew that and was also very careful. But when we look at Jean du Bellet and how close he was to Anne Boleyn and the things he did to help Anne Boleyn, again, everything in my book, in details, um, you see that his patron being Marguerite, we can imagine that they might have had some sorts of conversations about it, where Marguerite didn't show some disdain for Anne Boleyn. Marguerite of Angoulême is a true force to be reckoned with. She's an example for so many women who followed her footstep. She's strong, she's powerful, she's smart, she's well educated, she's a true Renaissance woman. Her influence over Anne is well known, well established, but she didn't just influence Anne, she influenced many other women over the next centuries. I hope you really enjoyed that video. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a comment down below to tell me what you think about Marguerite of Angoulême. I'll be more than happy to know your own thoughts and to reply to any questions you might have. Thank you so much again for watching. I'll see you in another Once Upon a Woman video. Thank you. Bye.